going to hand it over. Uh, we have Dr. Fred Hurst and Dr. Corey Gordon here today from Northern Arizona University. And first, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Hurst. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Can everyone hear me? Yep, we can hear you fine. Great, wonderful. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> so, um, you know, really what I want to talk about is um, a little bit of background of how we created what we call personalized learning, which is our competency-based program. Um, sort of the philo philosophical, um, you know, background of, of what we were, we were doing. Back in 2011, we really looked at the, at the market and said to ourselves, the, our president uh, and I were talking at the time, and the, the real question was that we had was, how do we uh, leapfrog and really create a, a much more innovative way of providing education? Um, you know, one of the things that that we really thought a lot about was the fact that um, the education system that we had developed, you know, if you think about the, the online courses, what we now call traditional online courses, that we've all been developing over the last 15 or, or 20 years, if you were really early in, in on, the, uh, on the online um, adoption, those were really uh, taking regular courses and um, and just putting them into a slightly different format, uh, or maybe radically different, depending on how you want to look at it. But it really was still a three credit hour course, and it was um, usually time bound by um, you know semesters, or in some cases, again, if you were being more innovative, uh, five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks. Uh, courses, eight week, whatever, and uh, and that process was one that was sort of um, evolutionary as opposed to revolutionary uh, from my perspective. And so, what we really tried to do was to figure out, okay, so what do we know now that we didn't know a few years ago um, about how people learn and how they are able to um, advance within uh, learning different materials. So we looked at a lot of innovation leaders like uh, Clayton Christensen and uh, his work around disruption and um, and thought about you know if, if we were going to design a system from scratch, how how might we do that? We also looked at the latest in um, pedagogy sorts of, of things and research in how students really learn and the, you know, the fact that it is, um, that it's very iterative and such. And then there were a number of different personal insights that, that I think are, are, um, you know, interesting to, to talk a little bit about. You know, one of those personal insights was, uh, when I was, when I was growing up, I, I hated the formal education system, even in grade school and especially as I then got into high school and into college. And my problem with it was that, um, is that I was really frustrated because the, the teacher or faculty member really needed to, um, um, you know, teach to the middle. They were they were trying to move everyone along that they could, and um, but the problem was that in many of, of the subjects, I was, I mean, I got the concept right away, and then two weeks later, we're still talking about it. And I think that that happens to all students, or almost all students, um, in some areas. I mean, in my case, uh, I was a wizard at math, and I was able to really jump forward quickly and understand, and then I would be sitting there going, yeah, yeah, let's go on and, and do the next thing. Uh, but in grammar, I couldn't figure out, I could figure out nouns and I could figure out verbs, but beyond that, I had no clue. 
uh, and and I could not write. Um, so in those cases, I was feeling like I was being left behind. And I think that every student feels that way. Um, you know, one of the examples I give is that lots, uh, well, not lots, but some students are able to read when they come into kindergarten. And other students, of course, cannot. And, um, and they're often left behind. Uh, I mean, not necessarily in kindergarten, but over time. So really what we were trying to do was to figure out, okay, you know, how can we make this a better approach? Another uh, quick anecdote was when I went off to college at Indiana University, my advisor asked, you know, what are you interested in? And I said, well, you know, one of the things that I've liked all through high school, and I've read every book I could find at it, uh, on it, is mythology. And the advisor said, why don't you take a mythology course? So I went to a mythology course, and I, um, you know, took a look at the syllabus and said, I know all of this. And, um, and you know, I, I thought about it, and I thought, well, okay, you, you know, I'm in this class. I'll, I'll go through the class. So I attended, a, you know, the first session, and I thought, you know, I could really teach at this level because, you know, I've read everything that I can on this. So. Um, so what ended up happening was that I went to the first class, I went to the midterm, and got an A on that, and went to the final and got an A on that. But I didn't really learn anything, and uh, you know, and and so really what we tried to do was to, to create a system that recognized that some students come in with a lot of knowledge and are able to move very quickly through material. Um, that they have already learned. And one of the examples we use there is that if a student who is coming in is a uh, bookkeeper who's worked under an accountant for a few years, when they get to the accounting um, parts of our lessons in our personalized learning system, we don't want them to have to spend a lot of time on the accounting side uh, if they already know it and the parts of it that they don't know, we want them to move through as quickly as possible. So, you know, the concept development, as you see on the screen, what we were doing was recognizing the unique needs of each student and making that personalized. Uh, Corey, in a, in a few minutes, will go into more detail about um, a lot of this, but, um, but I wanted to talk a little bit. And then, of course, as fast or as slow as needed by the student to master material. That was really one of the, the key concepts was that, um, that if we really are to, um, to provide really good educational opportunities for students, we need to make sure that they don't get bored by either being left behind or by going so slow that they uh, are not able to be successful. Um, and then the last part, which is the part that I think you're most interested in today, is the just-in-time support of faculty and staff. And so what we want to do today is lay out for you how um, faculty roles and staff roles have changed and how they work together to support students in this um, new sort of approach. So our personalized learning initiative, this is our little short elevator speech. If somebody says, well, what is it? Um, so um, it's personalized learning. It enables motivated students. We always thought that it was very important for, um, for a student coming in and for anyone that we talk to about personalized learning. That, um, that we're really looking for the motivated student. That doesn't mean the student that is bright. It means the student who is going to be able to um, uh, operate better in a more self-paced environment who, um, I mean, our goal is when the student com completes it, that that student will be an autodidact, a, a self-learning um, person who can then um, use those skills in other ways. We wanted it to be a high quality degree. 
because um, that's very important. You know, we don't want to in any way cheapen the brand of the university, and in fact, we want to enhance that brand by ensuring that it's a high quality uh, degree. And more efficiently, more efficiently means with uh, fewer resources at scale um, that are supporting those students at a lower cost, uh, but also more efficiently for the student. We want the student to be able to, as we've already talked about, move uh, through as efficiently as possible. And then the, the lower cost part, you know, we wanted it to be at a lower cost um, because we think uh, that, well, we've all, I think, in all of our states been, to, been under pressure to, um, to deliver things at a, a lower cost, uh, the, the educational experience. And, uh, but even on top of that, we wanted to uh, have a, a cost level that, um, that would encourage students to try what we were doing. The customized coursework um, to fit individual learning styles, this is really important because part of what we did was we recognized that every student, regardless of, of their background, are going to run into um, situations where they're not understanding something. And so we wanted to give them multiple modalities so that they could um, learn um, you know, if they if they went through one modality on a concept and said, say, I just really don't get that, uh, we wanted them to be able to then go into another uh, modality and, you know, so maybe uh, one would be a, um, a video lecture by a faculty member, a very short lecture that is, um, you know, that is specific to the area. Uh, might even be another faculty member as a different modality uh, doing the same sort of thing, but doing it in a little different way. Maybe one's a lecture and the other is uh, um, more of a, of a construct uh, of sorts. So, and then finally, uh, acknowledging previously acquired knowledge, we wanted to, um, for students to be able to easily move through and um, and be able to use the knowledge that they already had, uh, again, to keep them from being, um, you know, bored. So we started out with three degree programs, computer information technology, a real natural if you think about it, um, because they already have uh, computer knowledge usually uh, when they're taking that degree. Small business administration, a degree program that would allow students who uh, the majority of um, of people who work in businesses work in small business, and so we thought that was a, a good good degree program. And then the liberal arts, uh, really as a degree completion program, and uh, especially for a student who has explored a lot of things in their academic career but have not finished things. And then we're developing three new degree programs: RS to be RN to be uh, BSN. Um, that's a really interesting one. For those of you who, there, who are really familiar with nursing, you know that uh, the curriculum is all competency-based anyway, uh, which is great. Uh, management uh, degree is another that we're in the process of development, and uh, that will have human resources and healthcare emphasis areas. And then we're looking at a, uh, a Master of Science in Computer Information Technology to build on the bachelor's program that we already have in place. Um, the cost is quite low, $2,500 for six months subscription. And the, um, the student can learn as much in that length of time as they can. We call it the Netflix um, sort of approach where you pay a subscription and, and you can uh, um, learn as much as you can in that length of time. And the other thing that we did, and I'm just keeping this at a very high level, is we created the general education requirements in a modular um, fashion and require uh, students to have uh, a minor uh, within those, um, those degree programs. So 
So I've already talked about the self-paced. Uh, obviously, it's online. Eventually, um, you know, part of our concept for this has always been that we would have adaptive learning. And when I talk about adaptive learning, what I'm really talking about is a learning management system who, that, that, who, <laughs> that's kind of a Freudian slip. I mean, yes, I would like it to be an intelligent. Uh, uh, but a, a learning management system that will analyze the, what the student is having difficulty with. For example, if the student is trying to go through a lesson and that lesson involves probability and that, and the student doesn't understand probability, I'd like for the LMS to recognize that and to real time shift the student over to a module where they would learn probability and then come back to the concept that they were having difficulty with. Um, that adaptive learning right now, it, truthfully, it doesn't list, uh, doesn't exist. There are lots of different um, organizations who are working on adaptive learning, but I haven't, and the colleagues I talk with have not seen anything that uh, is really there. Um, we have uh, mentor faculty, which is part of the um, advising, and I think I will uh, hold off on that and let um, Corey talk more about that. The general structure of what we do is that to try to make sure that the student is ready, that a student is a motivated student, uh, and that they have the background that they need, we have a readiness assessment that is required for every prospective student to go through and to, um, to either pass, or if they don't pass, we provide free developmental modules for the student to understand what they don't understand about uh, key concepts that they're going to need within the degree. Um, if the student is really not ready, meaning they have serious developmental um, issues such as they don't read well, um, they can't write at a basic level, or uh, they don't have basic quantitative skills, for example, um, we would uh, we would not send them to the modules that we have. We would refer them to uh, probably a community college or, a, or some other uh, institution to, uh, to do that. The curriculum is interdisciplinary and prescribed. We don't have electives for students, uh, which for some faculty is blasphemy. Um, but because it's interdisciplinary, it's not like uh, you take this three-hour course in um, some area of the humanities. There are a lot of humanities throughout the curriculum, and uh, therefore having electives is, is somewhat difficult. Um, every concept, multiple modalities, we've talked about that. And then once a student is inside the program, they have a pre-assessment, um, which if they are able to pass, if they already know some of the materials, they can just test out of it, uh, of those materials. Uh, or if in a very rare case, they're, they really, really, really understand what's going on, they might be able to, to test out of that uh, lesson altogether. Then we have interim sorts of, of uh, assessments, and then the post-assessment, post which the student can uh, take multiple times. One of the things that we wanted to create was the research tells us that the whole failure thing on the part of students is very demoralizing uh, for the student. And in real life, it's not the way learning works. In real life, you know, you make a mistake and you fail, and then you turn right back around and you try again. And so we wanted to create something that wasn't a high stakes, oh, I flunked this course, now I have to take the whole course over again. We wanted to create something where they uh, are welcome to fail the first time, and then, but then they go back and they, they don't take the course or the lesson that they failed again. What they do is they study the parts of it that they didn't get in the first place. So it's much more efficient and effective for the student. So. 
just really quickly, we had a very aggressive timetable. Those first three programs we developed and launched in less than a year. Uh, we're a little over two years in now. The um, part of what we did was develop our own student and faculty dashboards, our own middleware that um, as a competitive advantage, um, and you will see that in what Corey describes to you in a few minutes. Um, we were approved by the Higher Learning Commission, our accreditor, like Sachs is your accreditor, in May of uh, 2013. The first students were in June, so we're again about two years in. We came to an understanding with the U.S. Department of Education to offer Title IV financial aid then in August of that year. And at this point, we have 500 students enrolled and 6,800 prospective students, students who have uh, a real interest and are in the process of, of moving towards, um, we hope, towards enrollment. Our student goal is 10,000 in five years. So a lot of people say that sounds kind of crazy. Western Governors, last I heard, was in the 30 to 40,000 range. Uh, so I don't think it's that bad. And then, um, you know, th th three programs per year to, uh, to move forward. So how did we do this? Part of it was a Gates Foundation um, grant of a million dollars. Um, that was important as seed funding, but it was also very important as validation of the concept that Gates was willing to award us a um, NGLC grant. Um, we had really strong support from our president and the Board of Regents in the state. We created a partnership with Pearson because they uh, have experts in assessment and uh, were able to really speed up the process. We think it would have probably taken three years to roll this out without having a, uh, a partner like Pearson. Uh, and then, of course, budgetary. One of the things that's really important is that we hired staff and faculty that are dedicated to personalized learning. We did not ask other uh, faculty to do this. Managing the change, working with the faculty senate, curriculum committees, department chairs, college deans, industry boards, everyone who could have a question about what we, we were, were doing, we talked with. And then a positive approach to the obstacles that we ran into and constant follow-up to make it happen. So I'm going to turn over this over to Corey Gordon, uh, one of our lead faculty, um, and let her walk through a little more of the detail especially how the um, faculty and staff roles are unbundled. Thanks, Fred. Um, just to make sure, is my audio working just fine? Yes, it is. Great. Thanks, Fred. Excellent. Um, well, one of the things um, I'll talk about is moving from credit to competency. There really is no right way to develop competencies uh, for us. We looked at other programs, similar program outcomes. We looked at professional organizations. We also looked at industry standards. Um, but the uh, university-wide goals helped us pick those as well. We started the process by identifying the 40 or so courses that would likely be taken during a bachelor degree program. Um, in my case, I, I work with the liberal arts program. That was the 40 courses that would make up a liberal arts degree. These courses included humanities, history, philosophy, political science, psychology, and sociology in the arts. And um, my job initially was to break those courses down into learning outcomes and um, different types of learning goals associated with the course. Once I had broken the courses down, it really became easy to see that learning outcomes are not discipline specific. Learning outcomes um, cross and bridge multiple disciplines. An outcome like being able to analyze content effectively transcends multiple subjects. We analyze literature, we analyze history, we analyze politics, we analyze people, among countless other things. So these are the areas um, that transcend the multiple disciplines and that helped me shape the competencies for the liberal arts program.
the um, we have adopted what we call a cultum model, and the the cult. Um, I start here with the lesson level, but the C in the cult model is competency. The O is objectives, and then the L, here's where we pick up with the visual on your screen, is the lesson level. And then underneath the le lesson level, we have topics and then a mastery which in, within each of these. So that's, that's what CULTUM stands for. Our lessons, um, in, in a way, are like modules. They're, they're portions of a course. Um, and it was a very organic process for us in the, the breaking down of the syllabi. We looked for um, logical lesson breaks or logical modules to to develop. So some courses break down in two lessons, some courses break down in three, some break down to four. We really looked for how those courses were structured in a, a natural way and then and tried to have that resonate with our lesson development. Within each lesson, um, a student has a lesson guide that is kind of our closest thing to a syllabus. And, but again, rather than being specific to a course, it's specific to the lesson. Um, as Fred mentioned, each student um, has the opportunity to take a pretest, and that's their chance to show us their prior knowledge, their background experiences, things that they've done out in the real world. Um, and if after the pretest, you have all the different topics, and that, is, that breaks down um, the purple information to the uh, far right, those are, um, you might find readings or exercises or different multimedia or lectures, presentations, things of that nature to support the topics. Once a student's gone through all of the material, then they have the option to take the post-test and the mastery. And I'll speak a little bit more about the flow of the lesson here in just a moment. So this is a flowchart demonstrating students' movement through one lesson. As students enroll in a lesson, they're given the opportunity to take the lesson pretest. The pretests and the post-tests were built concurrently, so they are of a, a, a similar rigor and, and um, approach. The vision for the pretest is to enable students to test out of the lessons that they have the prior knowledge or real-world experience. It also provides the faculty a very solid starting point to diagnose what that student knows coming into the material, what, what are they bringing with them into the educational experience. So, so uh, Corey, this is Fred. Um, I'm not sure that the visual advance, have you changed slides? Um, I'm looking at a slide that says lesson flow. Is that not the same? Nope. Let me. No, I think um, I thought it was in the process, but Fred, if you'll right click on Corey's name and uh, make her presenter. Okay. Thanks, Fred, for catching that. Yep, now you have it. Okay. Um, there. Is that shows lesson flow? Yep, it, it's working. Great, thank you. Thanks for. Thanks. So, the, um, so then with the, the lesson, if a student takes the pretest and scores less than 86%, then the student um, would receive um, information from a faculty member on which areas of the lesson to focus on. If that student receives something along the lines of a 40%, most likely, he or she would likely need to focus on all sections of the lesson. However, if he or she were to score 78%, we could guide the student to focus on the particular areas of the lesson that seem to be the most problematic. Um, once the student has worked with the lesson materials, the student can take the post-test when he or she is ready. Fred mentioned that this is all self-paced, so that the student is the, uh, the captain of their learning experience, and, and when he or she is ready to go for the post-test, they, they have it at their fingertips. Um, when the student, if the student takes a post-test, um, he or she has as many opportunities as needed to score an 86%. 86% is our benchmark. After the, um, the post-test, the student will receive feedback um, and continue to work until he or she can get that 86%. Once the student is able to score an 86% on either the pre-test or the post-test, so 86% is that, that testing out mark, then he or she receives a B on his or her competency transcript. Once the student has completed all lessons associated with a particular course, the Bs for the associated lessons will translate to a B for the course on his or her traditional course transcript. 
if the student would like to pursue an A on his transcripts, then they need to uh, complete the masteries for each lesson. The student is given one chance to complete the mastery, and, and that's typically a, a culminating hands-on activity or a, a comprehensive project. The um, submission must be exemplary, receiving a 95% or better, and then um, if the student is able to achieve that, then they'll get an A for that lesson, and doing that for all lessons in the course will equal an A for the course. Corey, there's, um, there's a question from Erica Johnson in the chat about, um, she asked, is there a particular reason for them to score 86%? And in other words, what, why is that percentage their, your benchmark? And I would uh, ask the same probably for the 95% for the A. Sure. You know, with the, with the 86%, you know, we're, we're looking at a student being able to do certain things rather than um, just kind of pass a certain level. So for us, 86% represented an, a level where a student really was uh, fluent and competent in a, a certain area. Um, it, for us, it, you know, we have students that come in at 82% and, and we work with them and, and in some cases, you know, they can revise certain things and, and work toward that 86%. But you know, the, the, I think the 86% was determined Fred might actually be able to speak to that decision, but in my experience with the students, there, there's really a, a, the difference between an 80% and 86% is, is more than numeric. There, there's a comprehension and a, a comfort with the material that is, is demonstrated at 86% that I don't necessarily see at a 78 or 80. Uh, Fred. This is Fred, yeah. What I'd say is, um, you know, the, the philosophical thought behind it, I've already talked a little bit about, and that is, you know, since this isn't a, a um, high-stakes sort of testing sort of approach, there's no reason not to require a student to be at least a high B. Uh, certainly, you know, I would want um, a nurse, uh, let's say, um, to be a high B nurse as opposed to squeaking by with a C minus. Um, but, um, but even beyond that, you know, because of the way this is structured, getting to 86% is not, um, it's not a one uh, shot deal. It, it's something that the student can work on. Why pick 86% specifically? I think the answer was, well, um, we had to, check, uh, to pick some percentage and a high B seemed to be uh, about the the position we wanted to be. We have occasionally had questions from people who says, well, why don't you just require everyone to have pure mastery in the in the mid 90s? And I think that's another model that certainly um, could be pursued. But um, but this was sort of the middle ground between um, allowing people to squeak by with a C and requiring uh, full mastery of of a high 90s. And to, to piggyback on that as well, the students, you know, in, in my experience, they are capable of achieving the 86% and, and that additional support that they get to get there, um, it, it, it hasn't been problematic for students to achieve that. Thank you both. And there is um, one other question here. How many opt to go for that Mastery A? Uh, if you had a per general percentage or? You know, I, I would, I'd have to give you a ballpark percentage. I would guess about 15% uh, of our students are going for the A, and I, I'm seeing an increase in those students um, because more and more students are starting to look forward to uh, graduate school. And, you know, one of the first things we advise them on is that a, a straight 3.0 it makes you, you know, it's, it makes you eligible for a graduate program, but it doesn't make you particularly competitive. So as our students, you know, kind of get their feet wet and start to find success with our program, I see more students going for the mastery, um, and, and that might be a, a confluence of confidence and and um, ability to do so. But I do see, I would guess about 15 percent. Yes, 15 for clarification. Thank you. Okay, so um, we use a homegrown dashboard to track student success and progress. This, um, I, I show this because it's, 
one of our, our kind of central mission control for the students, and, and it's where um, the students get all of their information, and it's also where we check in and track them. So it, it, it provides a, a good conversation for what I, I think you're interested in is, is more of the student success features that we offer. Um, I'll just give you a quick serve, uh, preview of the dashboard here. On the top left, students can see exactly how many credit units they have earned. Um, they, the student also is able to see how much longer they have left in their six-month subscription. The uh, panel on the right of the screen is our communication panel, and it lets us send messages directly to the student. We can make the student aware of an issue or um, a, a technology downtime or need for communication, a, a to-do item, something like that. Um, we are also able to view instant messaging using the chat from this. This view of the dashboard is called the lesson map because the student can drill down into the competencies through the colorful circles in the middle. Um, each bubble within this color circle is clickable and represents the competencies. If you were to click one of the bubbles within the blue circle, for instance, it would drill into a specific competency related to the liberal arts major. So students are able to um, kind of navigate our competencies through this view if you toggle over to our transcript tracker, so you'll see up at the top of the screen there you have the lesson map and then toggling over to the transcript tracker allows them to view their coursework from the more traditional sense aligning alignment with particular courses that they're completing. The um, if students, and many students actually prefer this view, and, and um, I'm, I like this view as well when I'm working with a student, but the, uh, it's nice that they have the option to look between the competencies and, and between the more traditional way of viewing the program. Um, let's see. When a student graduates, they're going to get both the traditional course-based transcript and a competency report that explicates the competencies the student completed and mastered. It's our hope that the students will share the competency reports with future employers to show specific types of activities and learning that they engaged with throughout their program with us. Okay, the faculty roles. Um, I am currently serving as our interim faculty coordinator. This role is like a department chair of sorts. In this role, I strive to keep the faculty on the same page, which I'm sure many would agree is no easy task. Um, I lead faculty meetings, I handle student issues, um, in an environment where the faculty roles are unbundled, the faculty coordinator is, is a little bit like a project manager. We have three lead faculties presently who oversee each of the liberal or the um, personalized learning bachelor degree programs. The lead faculty's primary responsibility is the oversight and maintenance of the program's curriculum. So during the program development, lead faculty were responsible for the deconstruction of the traditional program syllabi that I talked about earlier, um, the identification of this, the competencies, the reconstruction of the program content into the learning modules. Um, the lead faculty developed the content for the lessons, ranging from um, the instructional materials like readings and PowerPoints to multi multimodal resources like films and case studies. We developed, um, work, worked on the assessments and the rubrics um, and got that all launched uh, within that first year. The faculty mentor's role is something more of an advisor. The faculty mentors are connected with their students from matriculation through graduation. <clears throat> Pardon me. Faculty mentors are in contact with students on a weekly basis to ensure that things are going well and to troubleshoot issues as they arise. Students might reach out to a faculty mentor um, if life issues are becoming a distraction or if they are having any trouble with a particular lesson or experiencing technical difficulties. The faculty mentor is a student's go-to person. I think of the faculty mentor as kind of like a, an air traffic controller. He or she is the first line of contact for the students and then will help direct the students to the person or resources they need specifically. Um, and then additionally, the faculty mentor, once directing them to their resources, the faculty mentor follows up with the student to ensure their needs are met and the concerns have been addressed. One of the resources that the faculty mentor might guide a student to is our subject matter faculty. 
the students, um, if a student's struggling with a particular lesson, and, and Fred mentioned the just-in-time tutoring and, and resources that we have available, subject matter faculty is that just-in-time resource. So if a student is having the issue with probability that Fred described earlier, we, um, and since we don't have the adaptive element right now in place, our subject matter faculty provide that adaptive learning opportunity and the additional resources that individual student needs to be successful. And it, it looks different for all students. It, we try to give students everything they need at their, when they start, and then as they run into particular issues, then we have the resources to support the student in a one-on-one -on -one capacity. The subject matter faculty do a little bit of the um, assessment and grading, and then they also help keep the content and curriculum up to date and, and as relevant as possible. Um, and then finally, we have our graduate assistant graders. The graduate assistant graders handle the bulk of grading within the lesson. Um, they work very closely with the subject matter faculty uh, for tutoring resources, and, and they will do uh, minimal tutoring, but only in the areas where they are, are actively in their graduate work. Some of the realities that go with this new faculty structure. Um, Structuring team communication, or, or what I call avoiding the telephone game, is critical in this type of unbundled faculty structure. Very few people claim to like meetings, but for our team, meetings are the one of the realities of the unbundled faculty structure. Meetings provide us the only opportunity for team calibration. Um, we all, many of our team members work remotely, um, and so we can't get into the same room, but meetings that give us that chance to brainstorm together and to motivate each other um, to continue to kind of push the, the program mission and, and keep that. And, and I find myself doing a lot of cheerleading during the faculty mentor meetings and, and keeping everyone kind of on the same page. The startup mentality uh, for development work, is, as you're planning, it, it really is an all-hands-on-deck mentality. Um, we needed, really during our development, we needed a team who could do a lot of different things, um, really pointing to the, the next piece, finding a generalist, seeking generalists and interdisciplinarians, people, people who have a broad skill set were, were really valuable to us during our development. Um, we wanted people who were qualified to do as many of the development tasks as possible. Um, you know, we, at NAU, we began the development work with someone leading the student services conversation. We had someone leading the academic conversation and another person leading the technical conversations. And as Fred mentioned earlier, having the faculty and staff dedicated to developing and, and, and launching personalized learning was critical for our success and, and really, um, I think, it was a, a very important decision at the outset. Um, being Establishing clear roles as we're moving away from startup mentality now that we're, we're two years um, with students, we're, we have less of the startup mentality that we used to. But the, now we, we are at a place where clear roles is really critical. Who does what? Um, when a student needs support, who does it go to? And, um, you know, in some ways that, that analogy of the air traffic controller is, is really a good one because that person is, is you know, got to know who they have available and, and who that person needs and get that person to the right, right resource. The... Um, and then really the value of the faculty mentor, um, you can't say enough about the value of the faculty mentor and what our success coaches do. When a student has a question or issue, they go directly to their faculty mentor, and that person directs them to the best resource. Streamlining the student's point of contact is really critical to their success and retention. Um, you know, the, the unbundling of the faculty role has the potential of making things more complicated for the student because it's, it's a deviation from what they're used to. But truly, I think if it's done well, it has the potential to enhance the student's experience dramatically. The role of a concierge in a hotel illustrates the role of our faculty mentor. That person is readily available and knows the available resources better than just about anyone. The faculty mentor forges a relationship with the student and becomes the student's go-to resource, as I've mentioned a couple times. Um, I would like to think of the faculty mentor as 50% drill sergeant, 50% cheerleader. 
they're the ones who it's it's like the the personal trainer that you might work with in a gym. It's the person that um, you don't want to tell. You know, if, if you're trying to decide between nachos and grilled chicken, you want to tell the the personal trainer you're working with that you had grilled chicken. It's like the same thing with a faculty mentor. When you meet with your faculty mentor each week, you want to be able to tell them, I did all of these lessons and I, I took this test. You want to have a positive report to share with them. So success coaching in the non-competency-based education environment, I think there are many things that our faculty mentors do that really don't require them to be in a competency-based setting. These are key job responsibilities that lead to student success and I think can translate to any learning environment. Um, these are some of the roles that they do specifically. One of the first things they do is facilitate student connection with the university and other resources. Who is the student's go-to resource? Uh, when I went to college, it was up to me to identify my resources. You know, if I, I had to deal with financial aid, I had to get to the financial aid office. If I needed to work with the bursar, I was moved, you know, walked across campus to that office. And so that that can be a frustrating experience for students, and I think um, more and more students lose their patience or, or lose their ability to, to handle all the different um, options to them so that faculty mentor really helps focus them and, and um, keeps them working efficiently and, and focused and motivated. Um, the next thing, proactively track student progress and intervening as needed to promote retention and timely graduation. Most universities have some type of early warning system. Our faculty mentors are a human approach to the early warning system. They connect with the students each week. They discuss the students' progress and set goals. This is not something that requires really a competency-based setting so much as a success coach who has regular one-on-one -on -one contact with that student. Regularly consulting with faculty on students' um, work submission and, and time to completion. This, again, is something that has nothing to do with competency-based work, and it, I see used frequently in student athletics programs. Scholarship eligibility reviews might do something like this, where you have a faculty member who interacts with the student's faculty regularly to track that student's attendance and the quality of their work submission. <clears throat> this person connects um, and makes sure, just kind of has, the uh, faculty mentor really provides that big picture understanding of the student. You know, if, if the student struggles in English but, you know, is an ace in math, that faculty mentor recognizes that and, and can help the student strategically. Um, they provide basic technical support and use of the online tools and learning platform, and then they help escalate the issues as needed. Um, the Basically, this will connect with the first idea, going to having a go-to person. Since our programs are completely online, our faculty mentors have to be able to somewhat troubleshoot common issues. If they can't fix the problem, then they know how to escalate the problem. And then, um, really, this leads to the next idea, and I, th I think the, the most important element, um, advocate for resolution of student issues. When an issue has been escalated for a student, the faculty mentor or the success coach stays with the problem to resolution. Many students' issues fall between the cracks in higher ed. We do the best that we can to help, but then, you know, it, you do what you can, and then the student has to take it to another department. When you have a faculty mentor or a success coach, that person can follow up with the student until the problem has been fixed. Advocacy is one area where I think all institutions could do a little bit better. Having someone who checks in with you on whether an issue has been resolved is priceless. Um, this goes back to the idea of the concierge or, you know, another analogy is a, a restaurant server who checks in with you once your meal is delivered. Nine times out of ten, your meal's great and everything's fine, but it's that one time when it isn't that you really hope your server comes back and, and there's nothing more infuriating when um, you have a cold meal in front of you and, and nobody comes back and checks on you. Um, it's Students are not consumers, and I recognize that this model puts them in a consumer light, but students do have issues, and there, there's something powerful having someone who understands the university inside and out, who is advocating for you and checking in with you to make sure that your experience is good and that issues are resolved. And then finally, um, setting and communicating clear student expectations. Uh, you know, what are you going to do <clears throat> by when? Goal setting is intentional, and faculty mentors or success coaches can guide this process with students. 
this like really has nothing to do with a competency-based setting either. Many students genuinely don't know how to set goals and to keep themselves on task. A success coach can help keep them um, productive by setting clear goals and then following up with the student on their status. You know, if, if, if you know someone's going to ask you for a status update, I think it makes you a little bit more accountable to get things done. And Corey, a few uh, items. I don't know if these are left. Sure. Hi, I want to jump in. We have a yeah, couple of questions. Um, if you can look in the chat area from Melanie Clay. Um, are some faculty tenure track? What's the typical pay structure for these faculty mentors? And how many students are they assigned to? Or are assigned, I'm assuming, assigned to them. Yeah. Um, in, in personalized learning, none of our faculty are on the tenure track, um, but that's less to do with personalized learning and, and, and more to do with just the, the model of extended campuses um, where, where we are. Um, the faculty mentors all work in a full-time capacity and they're, they're on 12-month contracts instead of a nine-month contract. So their salary is, is that of a, a full-time faculty member. And the subject matter faculty are half-time rather than being in an adjunct capacity where you have them, you know, four months of the year and then they're off contract for a while. We have them in a consistent um, 20 hours a week capacity and so they are constantly available. We have structured schedules when student tutoring can be um, set up and, and things like that so we know when those um, that faculty members are available. And did I miss one of Melanie's questions? Ginger? How many uh, students are they assigned to? Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, our goal for the faculty mentors is 150 student caseload. Okay, thank you. And uh, this is for Fred. Uh, did the grant funds allow you to purchase Biosig? Um, well, I'm sure I can say yes. I, I'm not quite sure where the the um, where that expense went. Uh, I mean, there was there were really no um, restrictions that I'm aware of. I mean, we couldn't do um, equipment purchases, but uh, as long as it was related, directly related, um, we were allowed to. I'd have to go back and find out truthfully um, if if the grant funds um, allowed that or or we even tried that. We were also being funded by, we were putting our own funds into it from extended campuses and the university also made a commitment, um, financial commitment to um, to what we were doing. So we would just put the, um, the expense wherever it made the most sense. Okay, thank you. I think that's it for now. I, I do want to encourage people to, to put these uh, questions in the chat room and I'll find try to find the best place to jump in and interrupt to ask uh, Corey and Fred. And, you know, we're just about at the, the Q&A portion anyway. Um, you know, just a couple things I'll, I'll put out there. I, there's a couple things that we've learned along the way. Um, autonomy and implementation. You know, we, our program was developed under the extended campuses side of the house. I think that was a really good decision. Um, it gave us a little bit of space to be experimental and, and to do some things that, that are a little different than how we do it on the main campus. Um, so I think that was a really good, um, important element to our implementation. And, and Fred mentioned Clayton Christensen. He, that's one of the things he talks about is when you have a disruptive program that you're growing, put it off to the side so that it can have a little space to grow and breathe. Um, the dedicated faculty and staff we've talked about a few times already. Um, I, I think there was a benefit to developing multiple programs concurrently. You know, the it, it, one as a faculty member, it, it gave me other faculty members to um, to bounce ideas off with. There are things that happened, you know, while developing the liberal arts program that were unique. Um, but insights from the other two programs, it, it could help me kind of work through some of the decision making. Um, I think it also gave the students a sense of a, a, a bigger program with a little bit more stability when they launched. It wasn't just the one program. There were three different programs that, that all fell into the same um, same category. Uh, Buy-in from the colleagues. I, I, I put that that's both a pro and a con. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we launched with a good deal of buy-in, but it wasn't 100% buy-in. 
um, and you know that we've we've done a lot of work and and um, we've had a positive attitude about criticism and and concerns and and we've been really um, try to be as transparent as possible. That you know that if you wait for 100% consensus, it's it's going to be 10 years before you can can launch. Um, and then just the likelihood of revisions. This is <laughs> is always a work in progress, and and we're we're right now in a big curricular improvement period, and and those things as as we learn lessons and get feedback from the students, we're constantly growing and evolving. But I'll move it on to the question and answer. I think um, you know we're open for anything that that you want to discuss. And it looks like there's some questions in the chat. Yeah, I think we we uh, we missed Jason's questions about. How are they paid? Are they paid per student? And then, yeah, yeah. So I, I pasted it in. The pay for faculty is is salaried, so they, you know, they they are paid for their their salary. I have um, faculty members, mentors in the liberal arts program that have a couple fewer students than the computer information technology program. Those are just program enrollment numbers rather than um, caseload. Um, all three programs have the same goal: caseload for our faculty. Um, go, ahead. Go, ahead. go ahead. No, please go ahead. Help. How okay. about the typical number of lessons that students complete each six months? You know, the, our goal, and, and part of this is driven by financial aid, our goal is for students to complete tw the equivalent of 12 credits per six month subscription. So that's kind of keeping them aligned with a full time capacity that, that you would do in a, a 16 week course. And students, um, some students way overshoot 12. I see students do as many as 20 to 30 in a, a six-month subscription, and I, I see other students who do as few as one. Um, so that kind of goes back to the idea of, of having really motivated students who are able to self-propel is something that, that I think is really important. Okay. Uh, Melanie wondered about how many staff you had in their roles, and then if you think you'll be self-sustaining. I'll let Fred <laughs> discuss this <laughs> thing. Uh, we currently have 20, 22 faculty members in the program. Uh, 10 of them are full time and 12 are, are half time. And that's for all, th all three. Um, and that, that's with 500 students. So is it going to be sustainable? Yes. Um, we. Uh, have not reached a break-even point, but we did meet our um, our um, revenue projections for this year. We think we have, from the beginning, thought that it was um, that it would take at least three years to break even um, because there are a lot of upfront costs in doing this. Uh, and I'll kind of just segue into one of the other questions, how feasible would the transformation have been without the Gates grant? And the answer uh, is that uh, it would have been more difficult, but we were already committed to do this, and the, the Gates grant came along, and we said, you know, this is what we, uh, I mean, yeah, this will help a lot, but we had already made the commitment to go down this route. Um, and uh, I think at this point we've put five or six million dollars into it. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I say when I do presentations is, you know, this is not a, um, what am I wanting to say here? This is not like online, uh, traditional online learning where you can pay a faculty member a little bit for summer and uh, and have them develop a, a course. It's uh, it's really redesigning the curriculum for a degree program, um, sort of from scratch. And that is not um, going to be able to be done on an incremental course sort of basis. If this is the approach you want to take, lots of different flavors of competency based. That's for sure. Okay. What about financial aid? If the, do they lose it if they complete less than twelve hours? Um, they in their first subscription, um, if they are not able to eat, um, achieve twelve, they are given a second subscription in a uh, warning status where they have to complete twenty-four um, in order to continue with financial aid. Okay. 
Oh, Melody also wondered if there were any non-faculty staff. Yes, absolutely. We have um, a team, um, a director who uh, oversees the student services side of the house, and she has a team of four enrollment and admission specialists who handle much of our student population. Okay. Um, there's these are there are a number of questions uh, at the end that I pasted in from the question and answer section. Um, they're from different folks, but there are several questions. Um, how long is, fa is the faculty mentor student relationship maintained? Ideally, that's from uh, matriculation to graduation. Okay. Um, and then it sounds like it doesn't need academic advisors? No. Our faculty mentors um, cross, they do both. Um, what about time zone discrepancies? You know, you, you'd learn to be real savvy with it. Um, we just, you, you get to know that student individually, and, and um, one thing that as, as a team, when we meet as a faculty team, we always defer to Arizona time zone, okay. um, because that's our, our, we're northern Arizona, so we, that's, that's our, our so you adjust like we did yesterday. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we try to, it, you always run into little time zone things, but it, it's, they're minimal. Um, Cheryl Dasinger wanted to know, do you think it would be feasible to have a group of centralized faculty mentors that could serve multiple institutions within a university system? Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's, that's an interesting question, and, and um, you know, we've, we've discussed the feasibility of having our faculty mentors work outside of, right now they're program specific, so I have liberal arts faculty mentors, we have small business administration faculty mentors and, and computer faculty mentors. They're all um, experts in their field, they're, they're all qualified um, faculty in, in those particular areas. So I, I think because of our Higher Learning Commission accreditation that we keep them discipline specific for that reason. Um, but if you're looking at it more from a success coaching standpoint, you might be able to have a more centralized yeah. function. Um, Melanie wanted to know who handled accreditation type reports. Uh, well, it's, that's a startup mentality. We all do. Uh, but they're, they're guided. I think Fred um, takes the lead on a lot of that with uh, Rebecca Garrett, who is our director for student services. Yeah, I'd, I'd jump in there a little bit and say, um, you know, it really is a, a team process around some of the reporting that has to be done. Uh, one of our AVPs is also involved in that. And, you know, it helps that I've been a, um, a peer reviewer for going on 16 years now for the Higher Learning Commission. and. I've been in almost every other role, including uh, team chair and uh, the Institutional Accreditation Council, which is um, sort of the due process for, for institutions who are concerned about something that's happening. So it, uh, it, it's something that we have a fair amount of expertise in. Okay. Um, Jason wanted to sing your tell you how wonderful you thought your program was. Well, thank you. I saw that um, comment. It made me feel good. And this one I pasted, I'm, I'm pasting from the chat, and I have a sense that this next one, graduate students are plentiful. That was a question, or do you use academic uh, from a third party, like instructional connections? Uh, I think the rest of that must have been something, paste the 256 character limit question was, I don't, I don't think that's germane, but do you use academic coaches from a third party? We don't. Our, all of our, we, at our institution, we do have quite a quite a few graduate students, and um, it's a very unique experience for our graduate students. They really um, they really get to get their feet wet and, and jump in with with a lot of the work and work closely with students. So they, it's been a positive experience from uh, yeah. what they say to me. Um, the faculty mentor mentor. Success coaches register the students if the students can't register themselves due to holds? Um, the faculty mentor is um, will help them. The, the dashboard is really their, their primary area. I, I didn't highlight it, but the students do all of their enrollment and lessons through the dashboard. So the, the faculty mentors will um, be able to work with the student through their dashboard that way and, and help them 
um, it's a typically, I mean, it's, it's, it's student driven, but the faculty mentors can guide them. How about how are, go ahead, Fred. We... Yeah, I was, I was going to say that, that it is a different process. Uh, you know, when you think about registration and holds, the student can't get to the dashboard until they have taken care of outstanding um, financial responsibilities. Um, once they get to the dashboard, that is they uh, in, uh, register and enroll themselves into courses. They um, they decide how to do that. So it's it's a different sort of approach. Um, you know, and do the faculty help them? Or do their mentors help them with if they're running into hold problems? Um, I, I, I mean, Corey, you, you can answer that. I, mean, I assume the answer is certainly anything they need. Yeah, and you're right. You, I think you make a good point that by the time they get to the dashboard, almost 95% of, of holds and, and to-dos are all taken care of. When they get to the dashboard, their final to-dos are ones that um, are just needed before graduation type things. Okay. What about training for faculty and faculty mentors? Jason wanted to know. That's all done in-house. Um, so our our three lead faculty um, who who launched the the first three programs, we all served as faculty mentors for the first um, batch of students coming in, and and one the biggest reason for that was so we could learn um, what that role entailed and and what the student conversations how they typically ran, so that that enabled us to be better trainers. Um, the faculty coordinator will be somebody um, who handles most of the onboarding and training of new faculty. Uh, Melanie wanted to know how your enrollments now compare with those in your first and second term. Fred, you um, I don't know. I think you'd have as good an, an idea as, as I do. I mean, we're at about 500 right now. Um, I think that, um, boy, I, I don't know if I can break it down by terms or years. Yeah, it, it's been an um, organic process because, and, and, you know, in our first first six months of operation, we had, a, you know, we had a lot of students who came in, and, and this is such a different system. You know, we, we had some students come in and, and decide that it wasn't right for them, you know, so that we've, we've had a little bit of flexibility, I think, in the last year or so that has really stabilized and, and dropped down. Our, I think our retention numbers are much better, and and the student understanding of what they're getting into is much better and the faculty handle and work with students better. So it's, you know, the the organic growth of the, the organization has, has been that where, you know, I, th I think our students have stabilized out a little bit more. Um, I just follow, follow, up, go ahead, Fred. follow up a little bit on that and say that, um, you know, in terms of, of the enrollment, um, it, it really depends on how much we can put into uh, marketing and recruiting students at any point. So there have been, um, you know, in the first year, we put uh, a fair amount of money into marketing and recruiting and also into, um, you know, the fact that we were doing something that was really innovative here at uh, Northern Arizona University what our president committed to was money for both marketing and for um, sort of, it's still marketing, but it's more brand recognition for the institution. It really wasn't designed to pull in students as much as it was to uh, reach um, uh, influencers of different sorts, um, business people, um, politicians, um, other institutions, we all know that, that U.S. News and World Report rankings are partially rep reputational. Uh, and so we were, we were putting some money into those sorts of things early on. Then there was a period where we weren't really putting much money into that. Uh, and yet we were still seeing growth. So, um, so anyway, it, it is something that um, 
you know, it, it isn't, I don't think for anything that we're doing in higher education now, build it in and they will come doesn't work anymore. It really, really requires um, some, some backing. Um, if a student completes a course in the middle of a subscription period, do they have to register for the next course? If so, how is that handled? Yeah, our, our registration is really fluent. Um, so the, the students, um, as Fred mentioned earlier, they can learn as much as, as they can learn in a six-month subscription. So um, the students aren't limited to do lessons. Um, that They can do a lesson that completes um, history, and then rather than doing the other two that complete history, they can bounce over and do a lesson that's part of psychology. So the um, the dashboard will track all of their work submissions and, and work completion, and then um, as soon as they complete all three lessons associated with history, then um, they'll get the full credit for that on their um, – we're, we're still bound to the typical university um, grade pushing, so at the end of the fall semester, at the end of the spring semester, um, when you – do all of your, uh, your your reporting, we have the same structure. So at, in coming up in August, we'll do a grade push. So for all the students who have completed, you know, all three credits of that history class, that'll push up to their transcripts. Make sense? Uh, so they're, honor, go ahead. They, they just keep working and, and keep enrolling in, in lessons yeah. as they're interested. Well, they pushback have you experienced from this idea from traditional faculty and administration? Oh, well, I guess that's me, huh, Corey? <laughs> I have some experiences with that, too. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's true. I'll, I'll let you kind of um, push in. But, um, but let me say a few things first. Um, I think that it really helped that our, our president was really behind what we were doing here. Um, we had a long time uh, faculty member um, who had been in a lot of different roles at the institution, uh, very well respected, uh, in, um, who was in humanity, so in one of the sorts of programs that would be most likely to have faculty who would have concerns. Um, I've served on the faculty senate, um, just really had good connections. Uh, I think that that was one of the real keys here is that, you know, if we had, uh, I firmly believe that if we had hired someone from outside the institution and to come in and do this, I, I really question whether we would have been allowed to to try what we did and to be successful in moving it forward. And even with all of that, I still remember a trip um, where our president and I and um, our AVP for Academic Affairs that I've been talking about, uh, Allison Brown, we went to Washington, D.C. to talk with the Department of Education about um, about financial aid, and we were in a period where we were having a fair amount of pushback from faculty, and we all went to dinner and had a long conversation about, you know, how to, um, to even up more the, um, the uh, communication with those groups, because at that point we were really concerned that we might not be able to do this. Um, you know, I, I think it really helped that we created a, a parallel structure um, that was um, that, where we were not asking the, the regular faculty, meaning the faculty on campus, to fill in and, and work on this, that we were really doing something inside. And we very much presented it as a pilot. Uh, to see if it would work, um, and um, so, but um, Corey, do you want to talk a little bit about liberal studies? Yeah, I mean, it, we, uh, we, we've really tried to look at um, comments and concerns and questions as an, as an opportunity to um, be transparent, and that's, that's just, it, it's been a, a really critical element of our um, 
to share DNA. Uh, there have been a lot of questions. There have been a lot of concerns. It's it's easy to take things defensively, and um, so it, it's it's really been a constant reminder to ourselves: don't be defensive. This is very very different, and and the more questions that we feel, the better chance we have to really you know refine what we do and and to um, show our colleagues that you know that this is something they can be proud of as well. So through that that transparency and through that positive approach, I, you know we've any challenges that we had early on are I think all but all but gone. You know the. I have every day I, I run into another faculty member, I have people say, oh, I think my program would be a perfect fit for personalized learning. Let's talk about how we can, you know, maybe build our, our model there as well. So it's, you know, the, it's just been, I think, be as open to the, the comments and, and feedback, but also, you know, be willing to stand on what you've done and, and say, hey, I, you know, I, I, I value and, and I, I trust that what I've done is, is academically rigorous and, and that, you know, once you really see it, you'll, you'll agree. So that, I think that's helped. Um, and, and now, really, there's kind of almost no issue at all. I see that um, Mary Ellen Dahlman uh, had, a, had a question or had her hand raised, and I unmuted your, your mic, Mary Ellen, if you had a question to ask. Or if you wanted to type it in, I'm not sure um, if we've got her. So. Okay, Ginger, are you there? Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Oh, Melanie wanted to know, do grade appeals exist in this environment? I would say that a grade appeal happens only from the sense that um, if a student you know, say a student takes a test and they get an 82% on the post-test, um, they might say to their faculty mentor, hey, would you take a, you know, can, can we look at that? Because I'm, I'm, you know, really close. What what did I miss and, and how do I improve? Um, and, and every once in a while the faculty mentor will look and say, you know, hey, I, I think maybe that student was graded a little harshly. So there, there's a, you know, I'm sorry to keep using the term organic, but there's kind of a an organic communication flow that happens around um, grading appeal. If a student really genuinely feels that they they were not um, graded fairly, then we we just we bring in a, multiple faculty members to review it and consider it. So it's kind of an ad hoc appeal process, um, but it, it it's more calibrating I think than an appeal process. Okay. Oh, and Mark, I'm here, Mark. I uh, just couldn't unmute for some reason. I had a lot of trouble with that, too. <laughs> so um, are there any other questions? Thank you for all of all of the questions, because this mm -hmm. is great. I, there are a lot of things that uh, I'm sure some of us wouldn't have thought to ask, and having people jump in is great. Um, if not, I will just tell you, um, all thank you for being here, and especially to Dr. Gordon and Dr. Hurst, thank you so much for your time. I, I second what Jason said, is what an amazing effort you guys have made. It's, uh, it's very impressive. So if um, those of you that are attendees, we will be sending out to anyone who registered, we'll be sending a link to the recording for the session. So you, uh, you should get that in the next day or so. And thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much. And, and Melanie, please, if, if um, there are further questions after this, please feel free to uh, connect people with me. I'd be happy to answer additional questions via email. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks very much.